afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DxO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today I'll be taking you on um, a little exploration of this idea of selective colorization, making photos black and white, but leaving just a little bit of it color. I, I gotta admit, this is not a technique that I'm particularly a huge fan of, which made it an interesting challenge for me to find ways that I myself thought were quite interesting to uh, to dive into this into this realm. So, so that's what we're gonna be doing today. Before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. I am, once again, your host, Photo Joseph. If you uh, aren't familiar with me, I'm a photographer, filmmaker, and YouTuber. In fact, I'm going to drop into the chat room right now a couple of links for you. Uh, just my Twitter and my YouTube handle. I would love for you to pay a visit over there, say hello. And also, if I could just get a real quick shout out into the question area, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me. Uh, make sure you see and hear me. You should be seeing me, hearing me, and seeing my screen right now. So it looks like everybody's saying all good there. Excellent. Also, if this is the first webinar you've attended with me, um, I do things perhaps a little bit differently than some others you may have seen. I jump back and forth into the questions often. So throughout the presentation, whenever I have a natural break or I'm waiting for something to happen, I'll jump over and, and do my best to answer your questions. So feel free to drop them into the Q&A area at any time. I will get to them as soon as I can. And I don't mind going over a little bit to answer any um, leftover questions if necessary. Also, if you think of a question afterwards, something you forgot to ask now or uh, whatever, just anything you want to ask later, feel free to hit me up on social media. Twitter is definitely the best way for that. Just at Photo Joseph everywhere, but at Photo Joseph on Twitter is definitely the best. Uh, let's see, last things. I tend to move fast and talk fast. Sometimes people say I go a little bit too fast and I do apologize if that is the case. However, you will be getting a video, a copy of this video in your inbox 24 hours after this ends. You should get an automated email from the GoToWebinar system with a link to the video so you can go back and rewatch any part of it that you like. And with that said, I think that's about it. Let's get going on this thing. So as you uh, probably know, the Nick Silver Effects Pro, oh, as Peter saying, before you begin, will you please send me the whole webinar? <laughs> well, there you go. You've got it. Okay. Um, somebody saying sound quality is not good. Um, I don't know. If the, anybody else saying sound is unaudible? Hmm. Let me just double check something. A couple of people saying audio issues. Let's see, nope, the right microphone is being used. So, and there is nothing on my end. Let me just make sure my, we'll just totally pause my syncing and on, um, what do you call that thing? Uh, Dropbox, Backblaze isn't going, yeah, I don't know. Everything else should be good. So um, hopefully the sound, sound is great here. Other people saying sound is great there. So, okay, so it must be something on your end. It, a lot of people saying sound is great. Okay, so anybody who's having problems with the sound, thank you. Hundreds of people saying sound is good. Anybody having troubles with it, please just refresh on your end. Hopefully that will solve it. Okay, let's get going, shall we? Let me close this window and here we go. All right, I'm gonna start with this picture here. Interesting picture of a couple of color filters. Why would I do this? Well, that, this is gonna be a really great way to show you how this works and kind of break down what's actually happening in a really clear and obvious way. And then we're gonna dive into a few pictures. We're gonna go into this photo here. We're gonna isolate the yellow cab uh, from the background. Uh, pretty straightforward, that's gonna be a pretty simple one. We're gonna do this one here, isolating the red on the boat and then the buoys from the background. And there's something kind of neat about that that we'll talk about. We will do, let's see, this one here, which is definitely a bit more complex because of the combination of colors that we see in the foreground. We wanna isolate the red rose and the green stems with matching colors in the background. So that's gonna be a bit of an interesting uh, interesting one. And then I think this is one we're gonna end with, unless we have extra time, then I've got a few extras, uh, isolating out the red and yellow streaks from the uh, from the car lights uh, from the rest of it. So so that's that's the routine we're going to go through today. We are going to be using Silver Effects Pro and I am basing this out of Photo Lab today. Again, those of you you who may have watched some of these other webinars with me, I jump around between Lightroom, Photoshop and go to web uh, sorry, and Photo Lab because these are all valid ways to start by moving into the Nick Silver Effect or into the Nick collection as a whole. As you probably know, Nick Collection 2 comes with Photolab. Nick Collection historically is plugins. They actually do act as standalone apps, which is kind of interesting. They don't have a, an open and save interface, but if you just drag a photo onto the app in the Finder, it will launch into that app, which is kind of cool. But they are really designed to be used as plugins. Historically, you had to have Photoshop or Lightroom or something else to act as a host. And to a degree, you still do. However, you no longer have to go out and buy something else. The Nick 
Collection 2 comes with PhotoLab, which is what we're using today. There are certainly advantages to using Photoshop, primarily, uh, most namely, using the smart objects and smart layers. That's something I've gone into in other webinars. I won't cover that today, but today we will be working entirely out of PhotoLab. So with that said, PhotoLab it is. PhotoLab is a, I'm not going to give you a full demo of PhotoLab, but in its uh, in brief, it is a raw processing engine. It does all your raw decoding. It does some things that even Photoshop doesn't do. It has selective brushing, uh, selective effects as well, some of which we're going to see today, and some really, really, really good noise reduction if you've got very noisy photos. Um, but other than that, we're just going to use it as a basic raw editor. And I'm not going to do anything to this photo here except open it straight into the plugin. To do that down here in the bottom right corner, you see it says Nick Collection. I click on that and I've got access to all of my Nick plugins. And we're going to be using Silver Effects Pro. So Silver Effects Pro, if you're not already familiar, is all about black and white conversion. I've done a couple of webinars already specifically on black and white conversion. And uh, it's honestly, it is just absolutely my favorite tool for black and white conversion ever. It's been around for a long time. It is an absolutely fantastic tool with an incredible, incredible amount of control. One of the features in there, and this is specifically what we're talking about today, is this idea of selective colorization. Within Silver Effects Pro, you have the ability to isolate using the control points specific colors to remain color instead of going to black and white. And so that's exactly what we're going to look at here. Now, if you've never seen Silver Effects Pro before, very, very brief, quick tour because we're not going to be using much of the tool other than the selective colorization. But very quick tour. On the left-hand side, you have all of your presets, lots of presets in here, and you get a nice big, thick thumbnail showing you um, exactly what that's going to look like before you apply it, which is pretty cool. Any preset that you apply changes the combination of settings over here on the right hand side. And on the right hand side, you'll see you have global adjustments, which includes things like brightness with isolations for highlight midtones and shadows, includes contrast adjustments, structure, and so on. The selective adjustments, which is where we're going to be spending time today. You can get into color filtering in here. You can get into film types, adding specific film grains or film response curves. If you want to mimic a specific film type, you can do that in here. Very, very powerful. Uh, and then finishing adjustments, borders, color toning, vignetting, stuff like that. But again, we're not going into all of that today. We are specifically going to be focusing on the control points because that is where we do this work, where we do our selective coloring. So the way control points work in general throughout the Nick collection, if you are not familiar with them, control points are masks, but they are masks that are created in real time based off of the chrominance, that's the color, and the luminance, that's the brightness, of the pixels that you click on, of the area that you click on. So instead of having to paint in a very intricate mask or to do a linear or radial gradient mask, which may or may not cover the area that you want, you can isolate very specific range of your scene using the control points and you can do it very, very easily. And the way you do it is simply grab a control point, enable, click on the little box here, and then click on whatever color you want. Now remember, this is a series of color filters. If we look back at the original, what have we got? Blue, orange, red, green, and yellow color filters in here. And I've clicked on it, and so far nothing's happened because I haven't made any adjustments. All I've done is added that control point. If I want to see what the what mask has been built with that control point, then next to the control point name over here, you'll see this little tiny box under this little tiny icon that represents a mask. And when I click on that, it shows me the mask that has just been built. In this case, the mask is white. Where it's white, the effect will be applied, and where it's black, the effect will not be applied. And of course, any shade of gray in between is going to be more or less of that effect. And so as I move this control point around, because these are very solid colors in this scene, you can see how it very quickly, very accurately isolates the effect to that particular color. So let's go back up here to this one to start. I'll disable the mask view. And while I'm in here, I have controls like brightness. I can make that brighter or darker. I can increase the contrast, the structure. But if you click on this little triangle, and this is the kind of little hidden thing here, it's teeny tiny. In fact, you know what? Let me very quickly, I keep forgetting to do this. Let me make my mouse a little bit bigger for you all to see. Uh, there we go, accessibility and display. There we go, make the mouse nice and big. Okay, back into Silver Effects Pro. Right here, see that itty bitty little triangle there? If I click on that thing, it opens up and it reveals a few more commands. There's Amplify Whites, Amplify Blacks, Fine Structure, and finally, Selective Colorization. This is the magic one. And this is a slider from zero up to 100%. And as we start to drag it up, you see more and more of that color come through. And if I just slam it to the side to 100, boom, there's our color. And that's it. That's all it takes to reveal the color, the specific color range that you've clicked on in a photo in Silver Effects Pro. And as I move this around, I can go, no, I want to look at the blue one. 
Uh, I want to look at the yellow one. I want to look at the, where was it? The green one. I want to look at the red one. And you can just very easily drag these around and you can create multiples of these. So this is one. I can either create a whole new one, grab a control point, create a new one, and then make that change again there. So now both of those are revealed. Or let me just delete that. I can also option drag any control point to duplicate it. So in this case, all I've done is change the selected colorization, but let's just say I've done a bunch of other changes. I don't want to have to recreate each one of those. So what I would do is hold down the option key. You can see the cursor changes to a little, uh, little plus symbol there, and then just drag that over. And now I've added that in. And so now I've got two areas that I have colorized. You can also, and this is very, very powerful, we're gonna use this quite a bit today, you can group control points. So I can command click on multiple control points to select multiples here. I can use the list, so if I've got a bunch of them, I can command or shift click on those to select them. And then once multiples are selected, there is a group button here, this little group icon. When I click that, we still have both control points. So there's the second one, there's the first one, but I only have one set of controls. And now whatever I do to this one, for example, the selective colorization, as I change that, it is affecting both of them. It's affecting all of those control points as a group. So there's your basic intro to those control points. Now, let me ungroup this and I'm gonna get rid of that second one there. I'm gonna move the control point down here to the red and we're gonna look at something that's happening in here. Let's zoom in a little bit here. If you look closely, well, let me, let me reset this one up to the orange. This has isolated the orange out quite nicely, right? That, that's pretty good. But look at this shadow area there. It's gone completely black and white. You might be thinking, well, that's odd because it probably isn't, it probably wasn't black. It, it, what was that? It was some shade of orange, right? It was the light casting through. Okay, well, keep that in your mind. Let me move the control point over here to the red. Now we've got this red showing, but hold on a second. Suddenly this is red. Wait a second, that wasn't red, that was orange. It was the shadow from orange. Well, well, let's go back to the original color photo and take a look what was happening there. We zoom into this a little bit and we pan over. You'll see that, yes, this was orange. Yes, this was the shadow of orange, but look at the color in there. The shadow of the orange filter is almost identical to this red filter color here. Okay, interesting. So now we've got this kind of complex part of the scene that we need to build up properly. And in, in this case, let's go back to the filter. If I just want this filter to be shown in color, but I don't want that weird red crescent moon shape in there, that's not what I want. I need to block this out. And the way that you block out the effect is again using control points. But instead of using a control point where I have selective colorization turned all the way up, I use a control point with selective colorization turned all the way down. In fact, I use a control point with nothing applied to it at all. So I'll just grab a new control point, click on that area there, and you can see immediately that went back to black and white and it has effectively protected that area. Now you might've also noticed that it did create a little bit of shadowing here. Let me just disable this control point, uh, wrong one. I'll disable that control point. And as I toggle that on and off, notice the very top part of this color filter is being affected by that negative control point in there, by that protective control point. And another way that I can see that is by turning on the mask for this original uh, original control point here. And then if I turn on the mask for the, uh, let's see here, let's do that again. Uh, turn, on, oh, I got the wrong one there. Okay, come back in here. Let's turn on that mask in there. And we can see, let me do this a little bit differently. Let me actually delete that and add another control point back in here. There we go. By doing it in this order, by adding it after you've enabled that mask in there, um, you can see what is being protected. So now I'm seeing the end result of just this control point. And so see how this is now protected, but it's also blocked in a little bit of this area here. So if you really wanted this to be perfect in there, you might have to get a little bit creative. You might need to move the control point up and then perhaps even duplicate the protective control point to protect more of the area. This is something we're gonna be doing quite a bit of throughout as I build other more complex photos, but the combination of active control points that are affecting an area and control points that are basically inactive or negative control points that are protecting an area will allow you to isolate a region. Now, sometimes you can't get perfect with the control points. And then that means that we probably want to use another app. In this case, we're gonna use Photolab to kind of finish off an image to maybe protect or revert certain areas back to black and white. So a lot of different approaches here, but that is the overall a tool set that we're going to be using the overall idea of how we're going to approach this. Let me take a quick look over the questions real quick before we move on, see if anything's happening here. And uh, let's see, we got um, sound, people talking about sound still, trying to find the, where any questions might 
start um, someone saying Jane asking I bought Nick where do I find DxO photo lab it's part of Nick collection 2 so if you bought Nick collection 2 it was installed with it if you haven't upgraded to 2 then that's definitely what you want um, I was always asking where can we find the other black and white webinar videos the all of the webinars will eventually make it up on the DxO YouTube channel of I don't honestly I don't know I don't work for DxO I don't know what the holdup is <laughs> because I think a lot of these haven't made it up there, but they will eventually. They'll make it there. I promise. I just I just don't know when. Sorry. Uh, some people saying you only see me. That would be bad if no one has seen any of this demo so far. All right. Let's see here. Screen is definitely showing. Please confirm, people, somebody, that you are in fact seeing my screen. There are. Um, I see the session recording of people. Do you see me and the demo? Okay, a lot of people see me and the demo. So if people are not seeing the demo screen as well, we a lot of people saying they can see it, then there is a little bit of control in the DX, uh, in the GoToWebinar interface that allows you to see which screen you want to look at. You can make me bigger or smaller, the screen bigger or smaller. So everything is right on my end. It must just be a setting on your guys' side for those of you who are not seeing it. I do apologize. Um, a lot of people saying that they can see me. Everybody can see me. Excellent. Thank you. 450 people can see me. That is fantastic. Wow, there's a lot of I am definitely not going to get to everybody's questions today because there are a ton of people here. Um, all right, great. And I don't think there's been any questions. All right, let's, um, if you posted a question, because I literally have hundreds of comments in here already, if you have posted a question, repost it, please. Everybody's saying you can see and hear me fine. Thank you very much. No need to say that again. Um, and let's just move on with questions. Okay, I'm going to cancel out of here. I don't need to actually apply this. And let's do an actual photo. We're going to start with the yellow cab picture. All righty. Click on the yellow cab. There we go. So this is the original photo now. Because we are in the raw processing tool, um, in this case, Photo Lab. Of course, you could be in Photoshop or in Lightroom. Any work that you may want to do to the image in the uh, for the color effect, for the color side of it, you want to do before you send it off to the plugin. Once you hit send to the Nick plugin, in specifically in Photo Lab, it is going to render it out as a TIFF file, which means you're no longer going to have access to the raw processing capabilities of that uh, of the tool and the raw processing or the rather the raw capabilities of that file so if there are things like highlights that you need to recover shadows you need to lift up you should definitely do that before you send it off in this case i'm going to increase the saturation just a little bit i think it's a little bit flat on here so let's see here uh, color accentuation i'm just going to take the saturation up just a little bit just to get a little bit more yellow out of it and uh, and that's it that's all i'm going to do okay so now i want to make the yellow cab stand out against the background by making the background black and white go into the net collection button click on silver effects pro 2 and off we go Let's see if any questions came up in here uh, scrolling back scrolling back Ooh, a lot of questions already came in alrighty uh, Jory asking do you need to roll over your picture bottom right to maximize minimize your web oh okay sorry you're talking about the webcam viewing question um, Swamaya Schnur says can you do the opposite form a black and white previously converted image can use this method to figure out the original colors. No, this method is all about taking a color image, making it black and white, but then saying, oop, just kidding, not this part of it. That's what this technique is for. If you have a black and white image that you need to colorize, uh, the only way I need to do that is by hand. That's not something I've ever, I've ever played with together. Uh, Ken asks, how do you delete an unwanted control point? Simply hit the delete key. You can click on select it and then hit the delete key on your keyboard and away it goes. Okay, we'll come back to more questions in a moment. Let's move on with this particular picture. All right, so uh, this is our basic black and white conversion. I want to protect the yellow cab. So I scroll down to selective adjustments, grab a control point, click on the yellow cab, open up the, the extended controls, grab that selective colorization slider, slam it to the right, and that's it. Now it hasn't grabbed the whole cap, right? If I look at the mask, we can see that it is not getting the whole cap, right? It hasn't really gotten these edges here. If I go back to the main view and I grab this little handle here, we see that my control point by default didn't cover the whole cap. So it's quite interesting how these work. You'll notice that the edge of the circle, I, I can't point to the circle while adjusting it, but the edge of the circle there is not a hard line end of the effect. If you're used to working with radial gradients as a way to apply an effect, then you know that the center of the radial gradient is applied at 100% and the edge of it is zero and the fade is in between. With control points, it's much more nebulous than that. 
the edge of that circle is not a hard edge end. It's basically the edge of the primary area of influence, but it does extend beyond that as you can clearly see in this yellow cab still being affected to a degree, but less so out towards the edge. So in this case, I just need to make that color or that circle bigger. And what I basically want to do is make the circle cover the entire car. By covering the entire car, I know that I'm going to get the entire car. And now if I go back and I look at that mask again, there we can see that the car is selected. But I can also see in here that there are parts of the car that aren't selected, namely this area here, which you're looking at in the mask view and you're going, well, I'm pretty sure that was yellow. And if I go back to the original color version of the, of the vehicle, it was yellow, but look, it was much brighter yellow. Remember, I said it because of the reflection on the car. Remember, I said in the beginning, the control points are based off of the chrominant and luminance. So the color values and the brightness values of the area that you're clicking on. So in this case, that is significantly brighter than this part of the car. So it's not being selected by that mask, which means I simply need to create another control point up there. I can do that by clicking on control points and adding another one or option dragging this over there. So I'm going to option drag that onto that part of the car. We could probably make that a little bit smaller, get a little bit less spill to the outside. And now we have something that's much more controlled uh, over the car. I still have an area here that's a little bit less selected, so I can option drag that down and select that too. So now I've got pretty much all the yellow car and we are getting some background in there. That's okay. We're going to come back and fix that. But right now I have done a pretty good job of isolating the yellow car. So let me just turn these guys all off and we look at the end result and it's looking pretty good. Actually, it looks like I missed a spot over here. I interesting point. You definitely want to go back and forth between the mask view and the normal view, but don't get yourself hung up on making a perfect mask. The final viewer, whoever's looking at the final picture, isn't going to be looking at the mask. They're looking at the picture. And if you feel that this kind of faded off yellow here is perfectly fine, then it's perfectly fine. That's your choice. Leave it that way. It's okay. Don't worry about trying to make the mask absolutely perfect. You'll drive yourself a little bit nuts trying to get there just because of the nature of how these are built. But in this case, if I do want to isolate that area a little bit, uh, a little bit better, I'm going to go ahead and drag another mask in there. We'll, we'll make it a little bit smaller or another control point. And now I've got that yellow car pretty well isolated. Now, the blue stripe down the middle, I think it was blue. Let's double check that. Yep, the blue stripe down the middle is, of course, not yet selected, but I can add that in too. So let's add another control point. We'll just option drag that up to there. And now I've got the blue stripe in there as well. So now I have my yellow cab with the blue stripe against a black and white background but it's not totally black and white, right? If we look closely, we can see that there are some colors starting to seep through. And this is what happens when you add more and more control points, expanding on the range of original area that's being affected. As you, if you imagine a hue wheel, you know the, what the hue wheel looks like. If you imagine the hue wheel and the, um, the area being affected is like a slice of pie. It's like a slice of that. And as I add more and more shades of yellow and luminous values of yellow, that slice of pie expands and gets bigger, and it starts encroaching into oranges and reds and other colors around it. So pretty soon we start to see stuff like this, kind of some bleeding through of this red in here that we don't want. So what I will do is use that protecting method that we talked about with the color filters, and I'll simply grab another control point and add this in here. Now, before I click on here to add it, I do want to group these together. I mean, I can do it later, but it's clear if I do it first. You can see here I have all these control points. I've created five of these. I'm going to shift click to select all of them and click on that group button, as I showed you earlier, to make a group of them. Now it's just a lot cleaner. I can much more easily see all of my control points. And this doesn't mean that they're permanent, uh, that they're unchangeable. I can go in here and I can still change the size of each one of these individual control points as I need to. So there's a small one, there's a big one there. I can change the sizes. It's just that the effect that's being applied is global, is gonna be applied to all of those together. As I take that selected colorization down or up, it is affecting all of those control points. Okay, so that group is made. Now let's go back to protecting the background. So I'll take control point, click on the little reddish area in the background there and just boom, just like that, it's protected, it's gone. The area that was red has now gone back to um, back to black and white. Now, to be perfectly uh, perfectly clear about it, by doing that, I may have reduced a little bit of the red hue that was being adjusted in the car itself. But can we tell? Well, let, let's go and let's try it. Let's, let me hide this mask, and I'm going to toggle this control point on and off here. And as I'm toggling that on and off, we very clearly see the background color disappearing. Are we seeing anything in the car changing? Maybe a tiny, tiny bit, but this gets into that. Does the mask have to be perfect or does it just have to look good? And in this case, I just want it to look good. That's what matters. So I've got that control point made in there. I've got a little bit more red over here. So I'm going to option drag this guy over there, knock that back as well. 
and we're looking pretty good. Okay, so that's great. But remember, I, I haven't done anything to the base image. I haven't done anything to enhance the black and white part of the image yet. And maybe I want to do that. Well, remember, we have all these presets over here. The cool thing about the control points is that they are separate from the presets. So as I click on a preset like you know, this high key one, for example, the whole image goes high key, but my control points selecting, uh, protecting the yellow cab are still there. So I can go ahead and try out different presets, and that's kind of cool, and see what these different effects overall uh, would look like. And let's see, I know there's one that's kind of cool. I'm going to go for this high structure one. I think it looks really neat. The background's a lot more dramatic now. I dig this. It's looking good. But the yellow cab also has a lot of this structure being applied to it. Remember, I have added control points to the yellow cab, and I have protected the color in there. But there's still other things happening. As you saw, as I'm clicking through these other presets, things like the brightening and the darkening of the overall scene are still affecting that cab as well. So if I go back to that high structure view and I wanna get rid of some of the structure that's in that car, well, I can go in here and take the structure slider and dial it down, go negative, which is now going to counteract the structure that's being applied globally here. So I can take that down a bit like so and take some of that crunchiness out of the car. If I wanted to brighten the car, I could do that as well, brighten or darken that, I can do that in here. The, pretty much the only thing that I can't do in here is alter the color. I can't shift the hue. I can't adjust the saturation because this is a black and white tool. So I don't have access to those kind of tools in here. I can do this after the fact, after I leave Color Effects Pro, I could change the saturation or probably a better approach would be to try and adjust the saturation before you got into here. But you can do it afterwards if needed as well. Um, and there we go. So there's the, the final result. I'm going to go ahead and save that one and let's take a quick look over at the questions and then we'll move on. Robert's asking if you can feather the edge of the mask. So control points don't have separate feathering tools. They are feathered naturally. They feather out as the, I like to call it the sphere of influence, the circle uh, around that control point. As it uh, as you get farther away from that center point, it feathers out. But there is no manual feathering or brushing in there. Um, if you need to get into a really, really complex layering of control points, regions that are affected and not affected, then I definitely recommend doing that in Photoshop, where you can have multiple layers. And you can have the same photo in multiple layers with different versions of the filter applied and then brush between those. That's a really effective way to do things as well. Definitely a more advanced technique. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Mark's saying instead of option key on Mac, is a control key in Windows? Usually it's alt on Windows. Usually alt is the comparative to um, option on a Mac. Peter, were we able to download the samples to practice on? Um, no, that's not something I usually make available, but I can if, all right, Peter, do me a favor. After this session, tweet me to remind me that, and I will gladly put these images somewhere where you guys can get to them. Um, anybody who wants those images Follow me on Twitter, look for Peter's tweet to me, and I'll take care of it. Um, but you're going to have to remind me because I will forget after this, I promise, and I won't have a way to reach you anyway. Okay, let's move on. Next one, uh, the boat. That's what I was going to do next. Okay, let's try that again. Select the boat. There it is. In this photo, I want to isolate the red and orange hues, so the red of the boat and the orange of the buoys. And I'll be honest, this is not a, like, Ooh, this is an awesome example of black and white um, selective colorization, but I'm doing this for a very specific reason. There's something specific that I want to show you in here that I think is really cool. So let's jump into this photo into Silver Effects Pro and grab the control point. So we're just going to start by no other adjustments. I'm not going to do anything else in black and white. Just leave it neutral. I'm going to go to my control points here, grab that, click on the red boat, and expand this out to colorize the boat. Excellent. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Okay, good. So I've got my red boat in there. Now let's uh, let's option drag this control point or alt drag on a Windows machine onto one of the buoys there. Let's go ahead and make this smaller. We don't need to get crazy big on there. And I'm going to zoom into this guy. Let's zoom into 100% here. And here's what I want to show you. Actually, let's do two things in here. First, let me view that control point, we'll view the mask rather. And so here you can see as I move this around, it is just like with that yellow car. It is not naturally selecting the entire buoy because the buoy does have different shades of orange on there. Roof falling in. Um, so I'm going to I have a nice small area of influence on here. I'm going to option drag this control point a couple times to really make sure I've selected out that buoy. I think I'll also protect, it looks like I'm getting a little bit more of the green in there. So let's add another control point and just kind of protect that area. There we go. So I'm back to these three. I'm gonna go ahead and collect all three of those, select all three of those and group them. 
Okay, so that's good in there. But now here's what I want to show you. Let me hide the mask. And notice here that the reflection, if you zoom into 200%, makes it even easier to see, the reflection of the buoy is being selected as well. So the reason that I show this to you is to really drive home the point of how powerful this type of selection process is, the control points. If I was trying to do this by using a marquee selection tool in Photoshop or draw a pen selection around it or whatever, it'd be very easy to isolate this buoy, right? It was just a couple of curves, like boom, done, dead easy. But getting the reflection around all these leaves and like we look down here, like barely in between the leaves there, it's faded out, it's not as rich as it was in here. Doing that with a marquee, with a with a selection tool, be extremely hard to do. But by using these control points, we have a very accurate control over not just the color of the image, but even the colors in the reflections. And that I think is really, really powerful. And I would, if I wanted to do all these buoys, I would re-replicate this process. So let's go ahead and add another one onto there. Make sure the selective colorization is all the way up. Make that nice and small. And that one's actually pretty good on its own in there. Maybe it's option drag this over to the other side. Um, you can see I kind of had to drop it and let go because I'm zoomed in so far. And you see as I'm moving it around, it's get, grabbing different areas. But of course, where I want it to land on is the buoy here. And that one, again, has some different shades in it. So we'll option drag that out a few times and make sure that we get the whole thing. Oops. Again, always having the ability to, let's see what my, grab these three control points. One. Oh, another tip, by the way, for selecting multiple control points. Uh, you can do it here in the list, but it can be a little confusing of like, oh, did I get these and something else? What did I select? I can command or shift click on these individual ones, but as you can see, as they start to stack on each other, it can sometimes be a little bit hard. You know, let's say that I selected that one, then that one. Did I get that one down there? I'm not really sure. So here's another way to do it. If you simply click and drag over the control points, no modifier, no hand on the keyboard, just click and drag over them, it will select those. So it's just another way to do that. You can see here it's grabbed points seven, eight, nine, which unfortunately these aren't renameable. I really hope that's a feature I hope comes in a future version. I would love to be able to rename these control points, but I can't for now, but I can group them together. And now we have that. And if I look at that mask, we can see that mask is pretty good there. Maybe I want to isolate out some of that green around it and boom, there we go. Um, let's get rid of the control point views or the, the mask view, zoom out of that. And I've done a pretty good job of isolating that out. Again, I don't think this is a, good, is a good example of how to use the tool. I think this is a pretty rubbish one to be honest, but I wanted you to see how the color reflections would get picked up by the mask as well, which I think is pretty darn cool. All right, quick into the questions. Robert Wayne, if I want to modify an area with two to four colors, how do I get the mask to cover? We'll get there, we'll get there, don't worry. <clears throat> And Gary, is there a way to get Silver Effect Pro's filters and sub settings ported over to Photoshop? <clears throat> I've used them for many years. Can't figure out how to do it. Silver Effects Pro on the layer. I have no record of what filter and filter setting I use. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what you're asking is the advantage of using Photoshop and smart objects. So again, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not going to demo this, but just very briefly, if you convert a layer into a smart object, or you open a raw image as a smart object. And then when you apply a filter to that smart object, it becomes a smart filter. What a smart filter means is that you can go back in and re-edit the filter at any time. Nothing is permanent. I'll leave it at that because we're not doing Photoshop today, but that is the advantage of using Photoshop for this. Okay, next photo is, which one did I say I was gonna do next? Ah, yes, the, the uh, wedding photo. This is gonna be a little bit harder and this is gonna get into the question of isolating separate colors. So we have multiple challenges here. First of all, I want to isolate both the red and the green. So that's challenge number one. But a much bigger challenge is that there is red and green in the scene in the background that I don't want to selectively color, that I want to be black and white. So my objective here, my mission, should you choose to accept it, is to convert, uh, is to colorize the flower and its stems and leaves, but not the background. This is going to be a tough one. So let's get into it. Um, oh, before I go there, let me see if there's any work I want to do to the image overall. Actually, no, I think it's just fine. The straight raw process of this is clean. So let's go into Knit Collection, go into Silver Effects Pro, and see what we can do. Um, Tayo found Photo Lab. Excellent. Um, Joni is asking, can you work with smart objects via DxO products? No. The smart objects are only, uh, that is a Photoshop thing, which is pretty awesome. Um, all righty. Let's see here. We are, where did it go? There we go, Silver Effects Pro. Okay, Ooh. starting off, we're gonna start off with the red flower. That should, that should be pretty easy to do. So let's go in and 
control point on the red flower, open this up and expand out the selective colorization and boom, boom, we got the red flower in there. Okay, let's, uh, obviously we don't have the whole red flower. I mean, if I, I can just make this really big and get kind of all the red flowers in there, we can see the problem, right? We see what's gonna happen down there. And, uh, but it's not, it hasn't quite gotten the entire red flower. So instead of trying to be all global about it and try and get everything all with one, I'm going to really focus on these individual flower heads. And in fact, I'm gonna ignore this one over here. If we look back, there's a red petal peeking through. I'm gonna isolate that one out as well because I don't want that one showing up. I just want these two. So I am going to quite meticulously add a few control points over the red flower in here. It's looking pretty good. Let's option drag some up to here and get the rest of this red flower in there. And again, at any point, we can select all of these and view the control point. And again, you can view the mask. We can see we've definitely got a lot of the flower, but we have unfortunately got a lot of the background. Okay, that's good. We know what we're doing. Maybe option drag one more down there to get that. Okay, so there's the flowers. Clearly a lot of background, but we're off to a good start. Let's start uh, adding some green in there as well. I'm just gonna option drag another control point. Doesn't matter that it's green or red or any other color. I'm just dropping that colorization point on there. So we've got one on the leaf there. Maybe we'll add one there and get a couple of other leaves down here. And at this point, we have kind of expanded the mask so much that we are really seeing a lot of the background and color. It doesn't really look that different from the original, but we have now successfully masked out the majority of the flower and the leaf. We're, we're gonna refine it, don't worry, but we have got most of that selected. I'm gonna go ahead and select all of these control points, just shift clicking on this list here and group those together. So now they're all kind of separated off. And now you see why it's really effective to have the groups as I have a lot of these control points. If I left them on their own, it could be a nightmare to try and find a particular one again later. Okay, so now what I want to do is uh, start a whole another batch of control points, this time protecting the background. So another control point, I'll start with the purple flowers there. And you can see immediately, as soon as I clicked on there, it isolated out those purple flowers, but it was a very precise range of those purple flowers, wasn't it? It didn't even get the part up here. So I'm going to make the mask a little bit smaller, but we're going to be pretty surgical about this and just option drag that up to there and knock out some more of that. Okay, and so this is effectively what I'm doing now. I'm option dragging this around to try and knock back all these different colors that I don't want in there, even that red flower on there, which I'm gonna to have to be careful to make sure I get the edge, get the back of grandma's head there, make that a little bit bigger perhaps. Um, yeah, we got we got a lot of isolation to do in here. A lot of isolation, make that a little smaller. So now here it's gonna get really tricky because I have green right up against, the, green in the background, right up against green in the flower. So I'm gonna go back and add another uh, a control point that's affecting it, another selective colorization control point onto this part of the flower. So to do that, notice, let me kind of deselect everything here. I've got a ton of points on here, right? I've got this one group and then all these other ones that I haven't yet grouped. Let's start by regrouping all of the negative points. So there we go. So now I have two groups, right? It's either on or off. Group one is on, group two is off, cool. So let's go back into group one. And whenever I select one of these groups and notice I can select it by either clicking on the main control point or by selecting it over here, either way. Um, whenever I do that, whenever I select it, it reveals all the other points in there. So there is no control point, selective colorization point on this part of the flower. So I'm going to grab one here and just option drag that over and maybe make that really nice and small and try and isolate it down to that. Okay, so there we go. So that, that's that's better there. Now let's go back to the negative ones and we move, move that around a little bit. Let's get one over the back. I see his head in there and it uh, looks like we've got some colors kind of peeking in over the background over here. Let's get rid of some of those as well. And, you know, we're getting there. It's pretty good. This is, so let's make that a little bigger. This is looking halfway decent. Let's add another positive one over here onto that stem. Oh man, that is tricky. Let's make that really small. Now I could, of course, at any point, look at the masks. You may not like what you see because it's not going to be super, super clean, but let's look at it. Well, yeah, we're, you know, we're getting there, but this also gives me an opportunity to do a little bit of correction without looking at the colors, which again, I'll reiterate, don't focus too much on making a perfect mask. But when I look at this mask, I go, well, it probably could be better than this. So let's go into the negative ones. Now, remember, I've got the positive group. I'm calling it the positive group. That's the one that's selectively colorized. I've got the mask selected for that one, but now the negative ones are the ones where I'm actually manipulating, but that will allow me to see the effect on the positive mask. So as I drag these around, we see that we are isolating more and more areas in here. And, but at the same time, we are seeing that we are getting some expansion into the positive mask. So at any point, I might go back to the positive mask and go, right, we need some extra points in here. 
let's just option drag a few of these guys around, make a few more of them. Uh, I can just drag you up to there. And you know, it's just it's just a case of adding them in. And you can see it's not perfect. Oop, looks like I totally missed this spot there. There we go. But we are definitely getting there. And overall, what matters is not the mask view, but what matters is the final view in here. And that's looking pretty darn good. Now, there are clearly some areas that are gonna be very, very hard to get. I mean, actually, ooh, we got that one. Maybe we can get this green spot there. I mean, that green spot's right next to the other that I want. You know, I'm gonna call it pretty good. Oh, let's, we got a bit of a, a missed area over here. Let's clean that one up. But let's do a little bit of finishing touches for this in PhotoLab itself. This is pretty good. Right, it's really close. But I've got some areas over here where there's definitely some color coming through. And frankly, do I really need to be option dragging 200 different control points around over here? No, let's just let's just wash that whole thing black and white back in PhotoLab. So let's hit save. I'm gonna render this back into PhotoLab. Remember, this is a TIFF file at this point. So um, I'm gonna be working on a TIFF, no longer working on the raw file. And there it is but I can continue to manipulate this file here in PhotoLab. And then we do have local adjustments in PhotoLab. In fact, you even have control points in PhotoLab. I'm not gonna use control points. I'm just gonna do it a very generic way. I'm going to right click. If you haven't seen this before, this is really neat. You right click to bring up the uh, interface that shows you what type of tool you want. I'm going to just do a graduated filter and drag that filter over. And that graduated filter, I'm going to desaturate. So there's my saturation controls, just desaturate that. And now you can see that I have totally made that side black and white in there. If I want to get a little bit more precise, let's go into here. Maybe I go in with the um, the brushes. So let's go, let's make a new control point. Let's add a little bit of a brush in here. Actually, no, we'll do this. We'll do a auto mask brush, which ooh, now I have to change my mouse. So the um, kind of a funny thing about the brushes, when I have this large cursor size, so you can see the mouse, my brushes look abnormally large because they're all being blown up. They're bigger than they actually are. So I have to take my cursor size back down to normal. Now I see what the brush should look like. Um, so I'm just gonna go in here and kind of paint out that area in the background there. And the auto mask is going to automatically isolate that background there. And let's uh, bring that saturation down in there as well. And looking pretty good in there. looks like we might need a little bit of cleanup in there. So we can go in there with the eraser tool and kind of brush that out a little bit as well. And it's looking pretty good. So I'm just going to call it a day. You can see, obviously, we can spend more time working on this, but we have done a pretty good job here. Um, most of the work done in SilverFX Pro, successfully isolating out the red flower and the green stems from the background by making multiple control points, both corrective ones and the protective ones, or positive and negative, however you want to look at it. And uh, the end result is pretty darn good. And then we just finished it up with a little bit of a, a gradient over the entire thing on the background here because we just we don't need to mess around with that. We don't need to do it the hard way. All righty, uh, let's see here. Um, is there a keyboard shortcut for control point mask? No, um, it used to be, and this shows up in some of the tools still, if you hold down, I think it was command while you're expanding or moving the mask, it reveals the mask. That feature went away a long time ago. I've actually asked DxO to re-implement that because it was a super powerful feature. The mask showed up if you hold down a key and you moved or resized the mask or made any adjustments adjustments to the mask, it showed up um, temporarily. I thought that was really, really cool. Um, let's see here. Can you change the shape of the control point? It's always a circle. It is always a circle. Alona, when in Photoshop, you use black and white to adjust the colors. Once you bring it into effect, Effects to silver effects to I assume the colors cannot be red, so it means I cannot adjust the colors. Correct. If you are sending a black and white file to Silver Effects Pro, then that's what it's getting is a black and white file. So you want to do your black and white conversion in Silver Effects Pro, not in Photoshop first and then Silver Effects Pro. All righty. All right, let's uh, see. I got a few other questions lined up here. We'll come back to those. Okay, so that's that one. Um, we have 15 minutes left, so I am going to go into this one here, my final picture that I had planned and then um, and then I'll jump into the questions again because I see there are a lot of them. So this one, not a whole lot different than the one we just did, but this one I think is actually kind of a cooler picture to work on. So let's, uh, I'm gonna start by increasing the saturation a little bit in here. Let's just take that saturation up. Where are we? I'm looking for, looking for, looking for, looking for color. Is that what I want? There we go, color, color accentuation. And let's take the saturation up. I'm just going to saturate everything. It's saturating the blue and the yellow as well. That's fine. I'm going to end up making them black and white. I just want to make sure those reds are really, really poppy in there. Cool. Nick collection button off to Silver Effects Pro 2. 
Now this one is going to be very much like the red flower, except that I've got red kind of scattered all over the place in this scene. So let's see what happens. Back to the control point, and I'll just click on any anywhere. I don't know what really is red and isn't at this point, so I'm just going to click kind of anywhere on the scene, open it up the selective colorization, maybe make this a little bit bigger, and then drag it around until it lands on, boom, the lines. There we go. So that's effectively what I want it to grab. Now, how much of the the halo around that do you want? Right? If I look back at the original color image, there's a lot of really pretty haloing in here. See this kind of faded um, orangish reddish area out there and, and I kind of like that. So I don't want just the hard lines, I want more than that. So I'm gonna go ahead and option drag that out. So now I got a second control point and start to just kind of manipulate it, move it around and see how it affects the whole thing. I and mean, that's actually kind of cool right there. Um, what's going on in here? These weird black and white stripes, that's odd. Why are those black and white? Why aren't they colorized with everything else? Well, if we look back at the original, those were yellow. That's a different color. Okay, so that means it needs its own control point. Let's add one to there. Oh yeah, there we go. We get that color on the yellow, find the right spot on there. There it is. Maybe I option drag those around, make a couple of them in here, make sure we get some of that feathering, haloing off of there as well. Cool, cool. Let's add one over to here. Some more of that. Oh yeah, there's some nice orange happening in there. Yeah, digging it, digging it. We're getting there. Ooh, that was neat. Look at that. Hit an area where it really pumped up the selection. All right, cool. And this is what it's all about at this point. Just kind of option dragging these around and finding areas that you want to affect. And in fact, that's kind of cool. If I do that, I get a little bit of the blue. Neat, but not what I really want. So let's, oops, let's get rid of that one. Whoever asked about deleting a control point, that one's selected. I want it just delete on the keyboard. That's it. Move this over. Let's just really isolate out those red areas. I mean, it's kind of cool, right? I'm kind of digging this. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, this park sign up there should be red as well. So let's drag this up to there. Select some of that. Let's actually zoom into that a little bit more. Let's see here. Oh, it's yellow. It's kind of a yellow. What color was that? Let's see. Let's go back to the original color one. No, it's definitely red. So we just got to find that right spot to select that. Get some of that red in there. Maybe we're going to option drag around and get a few of those. There we go. We're starting to get a little bit more of it. Oh, there it is. There it is. The haloing is that's what's really red. Okay, cool. All right, digging that. I like it. I like it. Let's zoom back out. Looking pretty good. Now there is some spill, right? We've got some yellow spill over here and in the parking lot, which I could fix one of two ways, right? I can go in and add negative control points, which we've already seen. So I'll add a new control point there and that protects it. But that is definitely spilling out into the rest of the scene in here. So I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to delete that control point. I'm going to fix that back in Photo Lab. Again, it's not about, oh, this tool can't do what I want it to do. You got a bunch of tools that do a bunch of different things, use different tools in combination to come up with the, the final best result. Now, before I exit out of here, this is a night scene. However, the sky is so light that it's kind of bizarre. Why is it so light? And if I look back at the original source, it was kind of a light blue sky. Why is it a light blue sky? It was dark out. Well, it was not dark, dark. It was twilight and it was long exposure clearly. And, um, and the end result was I got a light sky. Don't want a light sky, I want a dark sky. So let's go over here back into, into Solar Effects Pro. I'm gonna select all of these control points that are all the same and group those. That's before I go anywhere else, let's still group those. Let's add another control point onto the sky, make that nice and big, and let's just darken the sky. Yeah, look at that, there we go. Now look at what's happening. We're starting to see a bunch of sensor spots. Ooh, dirty sensor. So that's something I'm gonna to wanna to fix later on as well. That's something I can do in uh, in photo lab, but right now we're just going to focus on that sky looking pretty good. Some of these buildings are looking a little bit too bright. So let's control those as well. Let's take some of that brightness down. Cool. I like that. Maybe option drag one over here, take some of that brightness down as well. Digging it. I like it. I like it. We're going to call it a day. Hit okay. Hit save. And that's going to render back into photo lab where I will then finish the image by fixing the bleed that we had over here. And uh, let's see if there's any bleed anywhere else I want to get rid of. So right there, let's just go into local adjustments, right click. I'm just going to do a very generic brush on here and just kind of brush over this area. No fancy masking, just brush that, take the saturation down, boom, works for me. That's it. I'm happy with that. Oh, I like how it's, look at the, the street lights got picked up a little bit. Neat. Cool. I dig it. So there we go. There's my selective colorization of this night street scene. I'm um, obviously a long exposure in New York City. The car is going, everybody who's been in New York knows this vantage point. It's a really cool spot to to take pictures from. Um, couldn't tell you what it was called. I have no idea. I'm not from there. But anyway, cool.
cool stuff. So that, that's that. So a lot of different approaches to selective colorization. All right, we've got 10 minutes left, and I'm going to end the demo now just because there are so many questions, and I really do want to uh, want to try and address these. Uh, and so if you're if you don't want to answer the if you don't want to, to hear the questions, then Sayonara, have a wonderful day. Don't forget to follow me on YouTube and Instagram Photo jo and Facebook and everywhere. <laughs> Photo Joseph everywhere. If you got questions, Twitter's the place. And if you look in the chat, I sent you links to, um, to the relevant ones below. And uh, you will get a copy of this webinar in about 24 hours in your inbox. Meantime, let's move on to the questions. Bonnie Kellogg asks, how did the blue on the cab get protected? Because I option dragged one of the ones that were on the yellow onto the blue. And so that made a whole separate mask basically just for the blue area, but I grouped them all together so they were all being affected the same. So it's just it's just about option dragging those or you know creating a new control point and then making the change to it to do the selective colorization. But it's just another hue, another color that is being affected by the control points. Jane, how do you delete a group? You can, that's a great question. Let me, uh, I'll just go back into I'll start over again, open this up. I'll create a new group and I'll show you how to break a group and how to delete the entire group. All right, so I'll just add a couple of control points. One, two, one, two. I'll add a third one by option dragging it. Okay, so now I have three control points. I'll select all of those. I click group, so now they're grouped. I can select the group here and um, del I think I just hit delete. Delete, let's see, that deletes the individuals, delete the entire group. Oh yeah, okay, with that selected, so let me undo that. If I select the group by clicking on the group name in here, they're all selected, I hit delete. That's funny, sometimes they all go, sometimes they don't all go. <laughs> A little arbitrary there. Let's try it this way. Let's try selecting that, delete. Okay, so that, there's your trick. You need to have the multiple control points selected. The first time I click on this group, it has selected the main control point, but it hasn't selected the other one. So if I hit delete at this point, it deletes that one, and it left at least one of them behind. It left, left both of the other ones behind. Uh, it converted this one to the new group master. So very interesting. Okay, undoing that. I have three control points grouped together. That's the master. If I click on the master again, it selects all of them. I think if I click it again, yeah, it deselects all the rest. If I hit delete right now, it's going to delete just that point, and it's going to revert, or it's going to convert one of these other ones to the master. In this case, it's converting that one. Undo. If I want to select and delete all of them, I can click on it again to select all of them, delete, and they're all going to go away, and it actually warns me, do you want to delete all of them? Yes, of course, they're gone. Undo that. I could also command drag over once they're highlighted. There we go. So once they're highlighted, I can command drag over, and that'll do it as well. So a couple different ways. Um, yeah, so that, that's it. Or there's this little delete button right there. <laughs> Look at that. There's a delete button. Delete that. And that deletes well, whatever selected. Same as hitting the uh, delete key on the keyboard. Okay, cool. Excellent. Good question. Thank you. Sandy Kroll, how do you change the name of the group? You can't. I wish you could, but you can't. Blue streaks, Jory says. I'm not sure about the blue streaks. If you want, if you want blue streaks in the car scene, uh, could have done those too. Gary Mack clarified, is there a way to get the name? Oh, okay. The name of the Silver FX Pro filter and subfilter when ported over the Photoshop layer. No matter what filter and subsetting you use, it only ever says Silver FX Pro. Okay, because you're not applying a filter. Those are presets, right? The filter is Silver FX Pro. That's the filter. Everything else in here, all of these over here, neutral, high contrast, this, those are just presets. So if you look at what's happening on let's open up the global adjustments for example let me start by going to neutral if i click on the neutral one let's actually just get rid of everything happening in here if i go, click on the neutral one everything here is at zero click on underexposed you see a lot of these have changed click on overexposed a lot of these have changed these are just presets these are not filters once you're inside of any of the nick plugins you are not applying filters you're applying presets actually i shouldn't say that's not true to all of them that's true to some of them some of them do have filters inside of the filter. I realize the terminology can be a bit confusing, but regardless of what you've done in a Nick plugin, when you go back to Photoshop, you hit save or okay, and it goes back to Photoshop. All you're gonna see there is the name of the plugin that was used, the plugin filter being a, another word for it, the plugin that was used in this case, SilverFX Pro or ColorFX Pro or Viveza or whichever one you used. So um, yeah, that hopefully that clarifies for you. How did the taillights get red, Dennis said. Um, how did the taillights get red? Weren't they red in the first place? Uh, back to the original picture. Where's the original picture? 
taillights were red in the first place. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Dennis, if you want to clarify that, please do. James, looking at the photo now, the control point defeating color stopped working. Um, I don't know which one you're talking about, James. Sorry, when you're saying now, it's hard for me to know because I'm looking at them later. So try and add a little bit more information to your question so I know um, what you're asking. Sumaya doesn't use Twitter. Uh, then hit me on Facebook or Instagram or 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 what's it called? Um, YouTube. Photo Joseph absolutely everywhere. Can you add more blur to the back and white background? Ray says there is not a blurring tool inside of SilverFX Pro. I'm thinking, I'm making sure that's true. Yeah, that's true. There's no blurring tool, so you would need to, to do that separately. I would do that. In fact, is there even a blurring tool in PhotoLab? I'm not sure that there is. Hmm, let me see it under local adjustments. I wonder if there's something. It's an interesting question. I'm not actually sure. If I brush that area in, I don't think so, because that's all, and would be here if there is. I have sure, oh no, here's, here's a blur. There you go. Oh, cool. Ooh, that's actually kind of nice blur. <laughs> I've never played with that before. Wow, that's actually a really good blur. Look what it's doing to the uh, to the spotlights there. That's kind of neat. So um, yeah, you got a pretty good blur there. So that's where I would add blur. I would do it in back in Photo Lab using the uh, the brushed areas. Neat local adjustments. Cool. I didn't even know that. Excellent. Learn something every day. Okay. Let's see here. Send you create the background of the cab photo as color on the final picture. Okay. So again trying to make your question a complete question just because I'm bouncing around so much. But um, Sandy, I think Sandy was asking about the blue earlier. Sorry, Sandy, just one more time, get your question, but get a complete question there so I know exactly what it is. Uh, Carol, I'm not getting any audio. Sorry, Carol, you may have lost audio. Hopefully it came back. Can group points be renamed? No. Is there a shortcut key to add a control point? No, but you have to click. You click to add it. My Twitter handle, um, Crampton, is Photo Joseph. I'm Photo Joseph everywhere at Lee Crampton. Thank you. I also added, I sent you links in the very beginning of the chat. Jorge says, how do you add another control point to a group you've already created? So the, the way that I've always done it is by duplicating existing control points. But let's see, because I don't actually know if you can add one in another way. That's a great question. Actually, I think it's just already running. Yeah, SilverFX is running. Okay, so let's go to here. Let's go... Um, so I'm going to add a couple of control points. So add one, add two. Let's select those guys and group them. Now I'll add one outside of that. Can I add this into the group? Don't think so. If I, let's see, if I select the group and the other control points and hit group again, does it add it to the group or does it make like a secondary group? It adds it to the group. Okay, so there's how you do it. So let's add a couple of control points that are not part of the group. So I've got three control points that are not part of the group, four, five, and six. Group one is already comprised of these three. If I select, let's say I wanna add this one and this one to that, I selected all of those, I hit group, and it adds them all into one group now. Awesome question. I usually do it by simply option dragging out a, a control point that's already in the group, but, um, but this works as well. Superb question, thank you. Ooh, good questions today. Awesome, all right. Can you blur or sharpen a control point? You cannot. Andre, can you add a control point to an existing group? Just did that. Can you, uh, Razvan asking, can you copy a group of control points from one filter to another? Um, I see there are actually five filters in use. Um, okay, so there's a difference in how different tools work. So in SilverFX Pro, you don't have filters. As I was explaining earlier, there are presets and that's it. So the control points are kind of global to the entire plugin, if you will. If you wanna copy those control points to another photo, there is a trick that I think works in SilverFX Pro. We're gonna find out right now. And um, and in, and we're gonna test this theory. There's a way to build a preset with that keeps a control point that I think works here. We're gonna find out. Some of the other tools like ColorFX Pro have filters within them. Those Color Effects Pro filters, each individual filter has its own control points, and there is interface in there to copy and paste control points from one filter to another. But in this situation, Silver Effects Pro control points are global. Now, as far as saving it to add to another photo, um, I would, if I, let's make some changes in here. Let's like change the brightness or uh, whatever. So I've done some changes in here, yay, okay. 
done some changes, I wanna save this as a preset. If you go down to custom, down here you have custom presets, there's a little plus to save that. If I just click plus, it's going to save this preset. Um, I'm gonna call this a default preset save. Default, default, ooh, D, default, wow, I can spell today. What just happened? I have default preset save. Let's try that again. And I hit okay. That is going to save that preset without the control points. Now, in some of the filters, and we're going to find out if this one effect, uh, if this works as well. If you hold down the shift key, the shift or option, see, I hardly ever do this, so I don't remember. We're going to try it. Hold down shift key. It, the UI doesn't change. There is no indication that this is happening, but let's, we're going to name it shift save. I think that saves the control points, but just in case it's not shift, I'm going to now hold down option and do it. And we're going to call this one option save. And I hope one of those does it. So let's cancel out of here or you can apply. It doesn't matter. Let's go to another photo. I'm going to go back into the knit collection. So I'm taking a whole different photo now back in there uh, yeah. use unique names. Let's see what happens. It is now rendering. You see the progress of the render down there now by that little arrow, by the way. And it's going to open. Here we go. Okay, let's look at the custom presets after some processing. There we go. Open the custom presets. So there's the default save, and this does not apply any control points. We see no control points there. The one holding down shift key. Yep, shift key saved the control points. You see all the control points are there. Option save. Oh, let's uh, reset. Let's see here. Apply. Um, Let's get rid of the control points. Control points. There we go. Delete. Delete. Ha. Ah, so I need to get all of them. Come here, you. Select all of them. Command A selects all of them as well. Delete. Yes, I really want to delete all of them. Okay. Option save. Did that save the control points? It did not. So it is shift save. Shift save saves the control points into the preset. So a little tip for you there. I'd forgotten which keyboard shortcut it was. Um, and I didn't know if it actually worked in SilverFX Pro because I've never done it there before. But there you go. There is the answer to that question. Okay. Moving on, Millie, is there a limit to the number of control points you can use? Does it affect how it is saved? Uh, first part of your question, does it limit the number? I don't believe so. I've never hit, seen a dialogue that says too many control points added. Uh, so no, as far as I know, there is no limit. Does it affect how it is saved? Remember that the control points aren't saved. Once you hit OK, you're rendering it back to PhotoLab. Now, if you're in Photoshop and you're applying it to a smart object and it is a smart filter, then those control points are maintained. And as far as when you hit apply there, it doesn't make any difference when you have lots of control points or none at all. Um, it does not affect when you hit okay there. And like I said, as far as I know, there's no limit, but I've, I've never run into a limit. Maybe that's what I should say. But also on, can you copy a group of control points from one filter to another? Okay, that's already answered that. Nice presentation, Kenny says, but for me, SilverFX is a fabulous black and white converter. True that. A far quicker and more accurate method for bringing back colors is Photoshop. Use a mask and paint back the color. Well, as we covered, um, that is not always easy, right? The, the uh, reflections being a great example of where control points are definitely more powerful than masked. But there is no one way to do things. Um, Alice says, I have slow DSL came in late. Sorry to hear that. Does this process work similarly if only if using only Nick Collection SilverFX Pro 2? Well, that's primarily what we've been doing. We did a little bit of cleanup in PhotoLab, but all of the work was in uh, was in SilverFX. Um, oh, Alice says, now you figured it out. DX says the host, SilverFX is the plugin. You got it. Jory says, that was a great webinar. You are very welcome, Pierre. You are welcome as well. Lots of people saying thank you. You are quite welcome. Um, Razvan, you copied your question in there like a hundred times. I got to it. I got to it. Uh, Joni, you're definitely inspiring me to look at PhotoLab 2. Excellent. Glad to hear that. Danielle says, do you think that there is any chance that Adobe will open the Lightroom for plugins in such a way that Nick effects and their control points could be applied to the raw files within Lightroom itself, maintaining the flexibility of the pure raw workflow? I don't see that happening, but I don't see it as that important because when you are using Lightroom Classic or Lightroom CC, both of them come with Photoshop now because it's a subscription model. So you get Photoshop. There's not really a major advantage for them to build that in. What they do need to do, what Adobe desperately needs to do is re reapply, re-engineer, whatever, to put in the feature to open a raw image as a smart object in Photoshop that currently exists in Lightroom Classic, they need to add that into Lightroom CC. I have asked them this 
Uh, it's a big thing. That's a big ask that I have of them. So hopefully that will happen soon. Uh, I had a meeting with the engineering team at Adobe maybe a month or so ago, and uh, that was one of my big feature lists. Like that is something I really, really want to see back in there because it does it does make this whole process more um, flexible when you're using the Adobe Suite. Okay, Omar, is it possible to download more presets for Silverback Pro 2? Absolutely. I don't know if DxO is, has any for upload, but if you just Google search it, I'm sure you will find some. The cool thing about the SilverFX Pro presets and all of the other Nick plugin presets is you can export them. So if I go back into, I have to go back into a plugin again, you can not only save your own presets, but you can export them, which means you could come up with some really awesome presets that you want to share, export them and put them up on your website for anybody to download. You could even sell them. Nobody's stopping you from doing that. You could sell your own presets. Um, preset sales is kind of a big thing. So you could really do that too. Let me show you how to do the export. So I made these couple of presets earlier. Let's say that I want to export these out. There's this little arrow to the right there. Let's click to export this preset and it gives you a name. It says that it's a file called an NP. And I think, oh yeah, there's an export all button that will, um, that will save that up. So there you go. So you export individuals or export all of them. That's how that works. Can you stack presets? Again, David, these are the presets are simply changing the effects on the right. They're preset adjustments on the right. So there's no stacking them doesn't make sense because you could have, for example, um, the let's go like the underexposed preset is making the brightness negative 14 and the overexposed is making the brightness 16. So stacking them doesn't make sense. They would kind of cancel each other out. So no, these are not you're, what you're thinking of as far as stacking would be stacking filters, but these are presets to the existing adjustments on the right. So there is no stacking. Jane, I always make a note of the pre preset present preset probably and mark the photo in PSCC with that name to remember it. I think Jane is trying to help out the person asking about saving the, uh, the preset name. So what she's saying is she just mentally makes a note of it or writes it down. Um, this one was called, you know, I made, I use preset underexposed EV1 or preset number one, and then just making a note of that in the layer stack. It's a good idea. Can you blur with VP3? VP, v, VP, v, v, uh, VP3. I don't know what VP, v, v, uh, Vive is it? No, I'm not sure what VP3 is. Um, we saw how to blur though inside of, what do you call it? Inside of um, PhotoLab, that was cool. James Madison, the finished version of the yellow car pick seems to have reintroduced the bleed into the black and white section. Well, let's see. I might've gotten sloppy at the end there, but let's take a look. Nope, there's a finished version. I don't see no bleed. Oh, there's a little bit of a bleed on the blue stripe in there. I missed that when I was in there, but that's certainly something I would have easily knocked back or we could do it now. Um, but yeah, nope, that's looking pretty good to me. Mark Fagan, how do you bring up the selection of Nick tools in PhotoLab? It's down here. It's this little button that says Nick collection. You see it down in the bottom right corner. This is only in the PhotoLab that comes with the Nick collection too. So if you don't have that button, you probably don't have the newest version. If you had an old PhotoLab and you bought the Nick collection two, uh, you may need to reinstall. I'm not quite sure how that works exactly. You may need to reinstall it to get that in there if you're not seeing it. Or you can always ask DxO's tech support as well. They'll help you out with that. Roseanne, thank you for your time. Well, you are quite welcome. James Ducker, Photo Joseph, you did a great job. Thank you, sir. I have learned a lot from these webinars. Awesome, it has really helped me become a better photographer and I appreciate it. You are quite welcome. Thank you for saying so. Mervin, how do I, I have Nick Pro 2, how do I get PhotoLab? You already have it, my friend. Simply check in your apps folder, it is there. And if for some reason it's not, reinstall Nick Pro 2. Uh, not, not Nick Pro, it's just Nick Collection 2. Gary, learned a lot. Awesome, a long time believer and user of SilverFX Pro. Super, fantastic, you turn, you present the info very well, thank you. As a presenter, I hardly heard any ums in nearly an hour, my compliments. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, um, look, see I said it right there, um, God, now it's in my head, it's in my head. Yeah, that's a tough one to unlearn for sure. Renee, I cannot see the show mask or new mask buttons in Photo Lab. You have to click on the local adjustment button first. So you click local adjustments and that brings up the uh, all the controls in here. There is a, let's see here, you can hide or show these overlays. Where did I forget where that is? If I accidentally close that, for example, now I don't remember where that is to bring it back. Uh, let's see here, it's not brush settings, that is that. That's so funny now that I've gotten rid of it, I don't remember how to bring it back. New mask, graduated filter control point. That is so funny. Oh, the question mark, that's it. If you, when you right click on there, that little control uh, question mark in the middle there, that brings up these, this little kind of floating help palette that you've got in there. So once you're here, now you have the, the new mask setting. So you have to go into the local adjustments when you're done with this, you hit close and it exits out of that mode. 
Hope that answers your question. Uh, Sumaya says, can you show how you did get the blur tool again? Certainly. In local adjustments, I brushed in, well, I, it doesn't matter which tool you use. You could use a graduated filter. Let's do a graduated filter and drag that up. And then there are three palettes of adjustments in here. The first one is brightness values. It's all the different brightness shadow things. This one is all about color. And then the last one is sharpening and blurring. So now blurring, let's just crank that up and it blurs off the bottom part of that picture. There you go. Thanks loads, Photo Joseph. CJ Martinez says, you are quite welcome. Dennis, fabulous, thank you. Jane, good one, you're welcome. Everybody's saying thank you. You are all quite welcome in there. Very nice tutorial, thank you, Razvan. Is it 7 p.m. US time or UK time? Must be UK because it's 11 a.m. here in the US of A. Uh, on the West Coast where I am. Off topic, will you ever do a webinar just about setting up the file flow for DxO and Lightroom Photoshop from camera to final storage? So you're talking about using Photolab as a, as a overall management tool? You know what I would recommend for that? I don't have a webinar plan for that right now. Everything is really based on the Nick collection. But if you pay a visit to my website, photojoseph.com, in here, I've done a lot of training, it was a while ago, but I did training on Photolab that is all still relevant. When you go here, you have a little thing here, that says filter by app. Scroll down here, these are all the apps that I've done videos on or text tutorials, some are videos, some are text. Uh, DxO Photolab right there, select that. And I believe, yeah, I did a whole series on Photolab. That's your DxO uh, live training session. Yep, so there's some of them. Let's, let's see here, uh, where's, I did more than that. Is that the only one I did? I guess it was just that one about control points. Maybe it was less than I thought that I did. Hmm. So there's a few written posts. Looks like I've only done one video on Photolab. That's interesting. I thought I did more than that. Well, there you go. There's one video in there. I That's specifically about control points. So it doesn't look like I've done something on the full workflow. But keep in mind, here's the thing. There is not really a dedicated workflow in Photolab to photo management, to asset management, because it is not a true asset management tool. Photo Lab simply looks at your hard drive. This is what you're looking at on the left here is not stuff that I've imported into Photo Lab. It is simply my entire hard drive. So you can click on any folder in your hard drive and you're going to see all the photos inside of it. So it's not really an asset management tool. It doesn't even have an import option. There is no import. You have to use another tool like the Finder to copy the fo photos from your memory card to the computer. Um, if you want to do things like add metadata, you can do that to a degree in here, but it's not really what it is. It's quite limited in the asset management world of things. Uh, so that's that's how that works. So I I don't know, I might be doing more stuff in the future, but, um, but not now. Okay, I think that's it. Is DxO going to upgrade their net collection for 4K monitors? Interesting you say that. So, oh, oh, because you're, Okay, I got you. You're not on a retina display, you're on a 4K display. Yeah, I, I hear you, it is small. I don't know. That's a really good point though. I'm gonna bring that up. Um, obviously I'm in discussions with these guys. Excuse me, I am going to make a big note right here. Uh, ask about 4K monitor support, i.e. bigger, uh, bigger, bigger text. That, what we need is a scalable UI because yeah, if you're using a, let's say a retina display, uh, a Mac OS retina display or a high DPI display, and you're on 4K, 4K screen, everything is just bigger because it's all bigger and there's double the pixels. It all looks beautiful and glorious. But if you're actually working in 4K mode on a 4K display, I have a 32 inch, I think, 4K display. I can't run that thing in 4K mode. Even at 32 inches, everything's too small. So I run it at a lower resolution, but uh, I totally hear you. I will absolutely ask them about that. <laughs> Peter says, will you, will you send me all the interesting stuff that you've tried to learn me? I, you know, I can't send you everything individually, Peter, but you will be getting this video in, uh, in, in your inbox 24 hours after this ends. Patricia, being my first DxO, Nick, thanks webinar. Uh, it was all great. You're welcome. <laughs> I got backwards in the words in there, but I got, I got the message. Great job. Looking forward to next week's. I am doing one of these every Thursday for the rest of this month. So there's a, we're now kind of refining the time. It's always going to be the same time. Uh, you are all quite welcome. Everybody's saying thank you. Let's see if there's any other questions in here. And it went, went down. Joyce, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. This will be sent to you in your inbox in 24 hours. Uh, Mark says, I thought this would be of limited interest, but I really learned a lot. Awesome. I try to do that. I try. Terry says, in the UK, we're told to tune in at 7, so I have missed all of this. Uh, that is unfortunate. When you register for the webinar, the webinar is handled by a company called GoToWebinar. 
And so whatever, when you get that registration, it'll show it in your time zone and you can add it to your calendar. There's a lot of ways to view it to make sure that you've got the right time zone. So uh, that is very unfortunate that you missed it, but you will, because you're registered and you're here, you will, even though you came in late, you will get an email in 24 hours with a recording of this. We'll be posting a replay of this presentation later. It will eventually go on the the who do you call it um, the DxO uh, YouTube channel. I don't know when though. Who Christine says it's worth getting up at 4:45 a.m. Oh, I love it. Thank you. All right, that is the last one. Thank you, everybody. We went 15 minutes over on that one. Wasn't expecting that, but there were a lot of questions, a lot of attendees. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, photo Joseph everywhere. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and all that, and definitely YouTube, youtube.com slash photo Joseph. I dropped the links in the very beginning of the chat. You should see those. In fact, let me just do that again, just so you have those again on there. Boom, there it is. And uh, make sure that you uh, you are following everywhere. And if you got any questions after this, hit me up on Twitter. I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you, everybody. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.